Mr. Chairman of the National Press Club, distinguished members and guests to this meeting, Excellencies, my dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, I deem it a great pleasure and honor to be invited to speak to the National Crowd Club in Washington and to talk about my home country, but really to talk about the world because I think mankind has one universal character, mankind who would love to be in freedom. Allow me to quote a few things from the Bible, uh, realizing, of course, I'm not delivering a sermon, but I remember Paul saying, what shall separate us from the love of God? Will retribution? Will hunger? Will death or life? Indeed, I may ask, what will separate us from the rule of democracy? because mankind loves this. The people of Zambia, Mr. Chairman, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, decided deliberately to democratize because I think the long history of our independence for the past 30 years before this was characterized by detentions without trial and all sorts of uh, sufferings and people went through them. I was one of those victims. I got detained. Um, and uh, the prison conditions are not quite uh, something you can write home about. And I think this has taught me I would never love to see any of my countrymen go to the same prison that I did. The people of Zambia, as a result, decided the best way to develop the country, the best way to involve everyone was to get a system of government that would be accountable to the people Every so regularly, the system would allow for the leadership to go back to the people and ask, are we still representing you? And the people will, by some measure, either by election or by some other method, they will say, yes, carry on. That is the program. So we have instituted this program. We have democratized Zambia politically. And we believe that the people are happy with it. The people turned out and voted for it. We have decided also that whereas the pre-1991 uh, election constitution did not allow for any, uh, any form of opposition, did not allow for any form of criticism, we have decided that we begin with parliament. Our National Assembly has 150 seats. My party or our party won 125 seats. The opposition got 25, much less than what the previous law provided for anybody to be recognized as official opposition. Official opposition would, not, would only have been recognized if they had 33 and a third percent of the seats, that's one third. And since they fell short of it, we were going to be the only party in that parliament, but even with those 25 seats, they were going to be incognito almost. But we decided that we were not going to be concerned with the number game or the numbers game. We were concerned with the principle of having loyal official opposition. So we decided parliament must accommodate and legislate that they become the official and loyal opposition, which they have become now. But that's not enough. Out of 150 seats, having 25 people making subdued noise is not enough. We decided that press freedom must not only be observed, press freedom must be promoted so that whatever we are trying to bury under the carpet and whatever may be passed in that house by our majority will not escape the notice of society and society must call us to account for it if the press remains free. So the press freedom has been well preserved and promoted. Uh, I have found out, perhaps, uh, it was much easier in the one-party state because even with the press freedom in brackets, in close quotes, even with the press freedom in one-party state so pronounced but practically stifled, it was much easier for the government then to work without any interruption. And one wonders even why the economy didn't pick up, because there was hardly any opposition whatsoever. That they felt, I think, is a, is a remarkable uh, 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 
character of the command economy and of course the centralized political power it doesn't matter how much time they have and what resources because there is no accountability and because there is no opposition anywhere they won't build because the input doesn't come from all other sides why they failed i don't know because i found out mr chairman that the press freedom in plural politics can be a little costly it takes you a lot of time to answer even answering crimes that you have not committed but that's how they are working now it's incredible and we love it because they represent those so-called silent majority people we have decided that therefore the centers of friction in our society must be allowed deliberately and they are allowed deliberately they are providing the necessary checks and balances having gone this far we have realized that we have taken over a rundown economy we knew it was terribly run down but we didn't know the extent and magnitude of its having been run down having got in there now we see we desperately need the world's help we are not passing the responsibility of having democratized to the outside world to the contrary we are saying that since democracy is what the world will share in the world must help us to sustain this democracy we have found out that our country owes so much money outside 7.5 billion US dollars and what they did with it we don't know because under the one party state everything was classified to talk about the dates the loans in specific terms was like uh, uh, committing treason everything was kept away it was only in the corridors of uh, government and perhaps that's the way it runs everywhere but that simply meant that we did we knew that the country owed so much money because the IMF program the world uh, world bank program were all I think withdrawn because our government did not satisfy the uh, conditions that uh, the two institutions uh, had placed before them so we knew the problem was there but the magnitude the extent and the areas in which uh, 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 this uh, was was not known until we got there now we know there is the bilateral date that we owe between government to government we owe the United States government we owe the United Kingdom government we we owe other governments but there is also the commercial date that is between citizens of countries uh, dealing together owed to banks owed to other enterprises having democratized in Zambia this has created tremendous interest in other people on the continent who wish also to democratize but Zambia has no model to sell perhaps the conditions in Zambia are not the same in the neighboring countries but the urge for freedom the need and desire for mankind to be free does not stem from Zambians practice Zambia's practice it stems from an inherent feeling in human beings to be free but the model having been said the practicality of it having been seen in Zambia other people are saying if it's possible for our brothers and sisters in Zambia to do it why can't we do it we will certainly do it and therefore this is like an example that has been inadvertently or deliberately given to our neighbors and they are saying if our brothers and sisters in there can do it and they have done it without throwing stones without taking up a gun to shoot and they have done it so well we sure we will do it that in fact is I think the real question will the Zambian model attract them enough when they see that democracy cannot be sustained because we have taken over the date which was contracted and the date whose benefits the nation has not felt will the other nations when they see that we fell because of this heavy dirt hanging over us will they be attracted enough will democracy accelerate will democracy move in fact from Zambia elsewhere the answer is yes but can it be 
a very delightful kind of alternative. If it fails in Zambia, I'm afraid the answer won't be yes. So while not trying to pass the responsibility and the obligation anywhere, the Zambian people have said they are responsible for what they did. They will suffer. They are ready to sacrifice in order to ensure that this democracy does work. But however, the Zambian people are asking a question. Since the whole world has said democracy is the right way to run the affairs of countries, to run the affairs of the world, since in democracy, Cold War will never show up again, there will be differences which, will, which we can sort out as human beings. The Cold War certainly was expensive. It meant a lot, adversely though. The people of Zambia are asking a question. Why must the world, which we owe money, money contracted by people didn't bother about us, and these people have now gone, and we have introduced democracy. We have introduced accountability in the system. The same world still says you pay as if they are punishing, up for punishing us for having removed those who didn't love accountability. That's the question they are asking. Why must we continue to shoulder the responsibility that was an initial creation of people that didn't actually want to be responsible for managing the affairs of a country. I have said I'll pass on the message that the world should be fair. The world must look at us more favorably, more kindly. The world should appreciate that not only have we democratized, we have begun good governance, representative government, a government that is accountable to people. Dictatorship aside, the command economy is away. We are allowing people to invest in this economy. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a pity that a country like my own, Zambia, three times almost the size of Great Britain, but with a thin population of 8.5 million people, with that vast land, 95% of which is arable, capable, as I said a few days ago, capable of growing virtually anything, pineapples, crops, corn, um, cotton, tobacco, virtually every and anything except, of course, as I said, land mines, they don't grow in my country. <laughs> with the exception of land mines, and booby traps, the rest can grow. What an opportunity. Tourism has such potential. Agriculture has such potential. Mining not only of copper, of other precious and semi-precious minerals can grow, or rather can be mined, extracted from all over the country. Such a land with vast immeasurable resources has not been exploited. Why? Because the government that was in power thought that they could not trust private investment. They could not trust a private entrepreneur. The government was everything. The government ran the economy from six in the morning until they got so tired they couldn't account for anything. So the economy could not grow because they didn't have neither the acumen nor the resources. They had the pride, political pride. That is what destroyed our economy. But the resources now are open. We have opened up our economy, which was 80%, 80 percent nationalized, run by the government and they left only 20% in private hands. We have reversed. We're starting a process of opening up all sectors of our economy to private investment. Mining is no exception whatsoever. We believe with this kind of uh, resources, with this kind of uh, uh, land, with this kind of possibilities and opportunities that our country can easily turn around. 
our country can grow. So while we ask for aid, we don't make it a habit. We know, ladies and gentlemen, that the world can, oh, the, any economy has its trade cycle. It will boom at one time, slide and slide, and it may hit a recession. And it will not be a good thing for the developing world to always rely on the developed world for handouts, to continue to move from one day to another asking for handouts. We believe that trading together will provide better opportunities to help those developing countries to grow, to have their own foundation. So what we are doing today is to ask that the world look at us more favorably. That democracy has no colors. Those who democratize in Poland, those who democratize uh, anywhere else are as good as those who democratize in Africa. And I believe that the way we look at Eastern Europe must be the same way we look at Africa. We all are people belonging to the same uh, uh, world. And I believe that democracy in one place will create conditions for democracy in another. If the conditions in Zambia deteriorate and democracy suffers a setback, we're more than sure that not only will the neighboring countries also pull away and wish never to, ex to experiment or experience it, we believe that other people elsewhere far away will perhaps uh, not deem it even necessary to try and start it. That will be mankind lost. I do believe that the opportunity has come for all of us to show that the Declaration for Human Rights, universal freedoms, apply universally. Where democracies, we, oh, you ladies and gentlemen, the people of the United States of America, with one of the longest history of democracy, and with so many things for us to learn, not only from New Hampshire, but from Maryland and elsewhere, as you start on your campaign, I think that you have a duty not only to ensure that democracy in America continues, but elsewhere where it is starting, elsewhere where it is in its embryonic stage and state, and especially on the content of Africa, you will have a solemn duty to assist, to help, to make it work. When you make it work, the whole world perhaps will turn around and move in one direction. I want to end, Mr. Chairman, with this observation that I came to America on an official visit, of course, at the invitation of my friends from the AFL-CIO, who have been tremendous, been helpful throughout. We have worked together for many years. But having been here, I am delighted that my program was very full. I met a cross-section of the American community I am delighted that this afternoon I've been offered the opportunity to carry on with the meetings. But I want to say, yes, we need help, indeed. But it's help to start that we may have our own base and carry on as a sovereign state. I'm sure that some other nations have been assisted when they are in straits like this. So it's not new at all. Africa's democracy needs your help. Let it grow. Let it find its fit. And the world will benefit from it. When the economies are open to accountability in Africa, they will offer the kind of opportunity for economies in, in Europe and America to trade with people who are able and capable of buying and paying for what they do buy. But if we remain in this kind of state, we will always be asking you to write off what we may, what we could have easily paid. I ask you, to help us start afresh. Let's not be punished for the crimes of, uh, committed by those who didn't value democracy, those who didn't value accountability. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.